The Unshackled Waves, episode 93. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. It's been quite a dramatic news week with some terrible tragedies and other major political developments, so there's plenty of talking points. Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts will join me in a moment, but first I will tell you what is happening in the world right now. The United States suffered its worst mass shooting in its history in Las Vegas. 64-year-old Stephen Paddock killed 58 people and injured 489 when he opened fire from the 32nd floor of a hotel on attendees at a country music festival. We still don't know all of the details, most specifically the motive, so it's hard to determine what is the appropriate response, but it hasn't stopped the usual leftist regressive immediately calling for uh, gun control and demanding a crackdown on the supposed epidemic of white male terrorists, as they call it. The people in the autonomous region of Catalonia in Spain held a referendum this past week on becoming an independent nation. However, the Spanish government declared the referendum illegal and violently tried to suppress voter turnout. Despite the display of police brutality, 90% of Catalans who were able to cast their ballots voted for independence. Given the Spanish government's opposition, we could see a dangerous internal conflict in what was a successful Western democracy. We got the first release of data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics on the Marriage Postal Survey, uh, as it is now known. 9.2 million responses have already been received, which is a 57.5% turnout. This turnout, therefore, is predicted to be high, given the mail lag from Australia Post. This shows that Australians have embraced the opportunity to have their say, and the result should not be able to be disputed, therefore. Uh, Polling this week predicts a strong yes victory, but it remains to be seen what the actual result will be. The Turnbull government's latest move in their nation's energy crisis is to threaten to withhold GST revenue from states that limit gas exploration. Both the Victorian and New South Wales premiers have already said they are not backing down from their current restrictions. While heavy-handed, it is probably a more rational solution than Tony Abbott's proposal to send the military into states to dig up uh, their resources. The Turnbull government has proposed a fresh round of anti-terror laws. These include federal laws allowing terror suspects to be detained for 14 days without charge and also the implementation of facial recognition software to CCTV cameras around our cities. Obviously, we all want to see terrorist attacks thwarted, but as we have seen most often, uh, these attackers have been people already known to authorities uh, who they fail to follow up with. Hence, we should not give up our civil liberties without considering all the consequences of these changes. Senator Nick Xenophon this week announced his resignation from federal parliament to contest a lower house seat at the upcoming South Australian state election. This is a welcome news at a federal level, as despite claiming to be a centrist, he constantly supports greater spending and government intervention in the economy. South Australia's problems will certainly not be solved by his return to state politics. Mining billionaire Andrew Twiggy Forrest's latest policy proposal is to have the smoking age lifted to 21 to reduce cancer and stop young people taking up smoking. We have already have introduced high taxes on tobacco as well as plain packaging. This would be an even more extreme nanny state me- measure. People by now know that smoking is unhealthy and if they wish to uh, take it up then that is their right in a free society. The UK government, as part of their new counter-terrorism measures, wants to crack down on extremist materials online. They want to make it illegal to repeatedly view extremist material, which part of the definition includes far-right propaganda. As we have come to know, the term far-right can pretty much be applied to anyone on the right, so the proposal of such broad laws simply for viewing such material is extremely alarming. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, good day, Tim. Um, interesting week of news, and it's uh, definitely good to be back for another podcast. Yeah, and uh, before we started, I had a uh, cough lolly, so I shouldn't go into a coughing fit like we saw Theresa May this this week. Well, well, that's good to know. It's good to know that we are uh, we're more put together than the Tory party. 
Yeah, uh, d definitely. We're we're professional here. Now, obviously, the biggest uh, story of the the week was the Las Vegas uh, massacre at a uh, country music festival. There's uh, 58 who were murdered, uh, 489 injured by. Uh, 64 year old Stephen Paddock, who opened fire from the, the set 32nd floor of a uh, hotel. What is most perplexing is that uh, we, we don't know a motive yet. So, in my opinion, it's hard to know what the uh, appropriate response is, but everyone's got an opinion on you know, what must be done. Yeah, well, it's uh, obviously you have the people coming out, the uh, people who are looking to hijack this uh, sad event for political reasons, uh, calling for such things as gun control, you know, more background checks. Um, and, and of course, that's what you expect. It, but, but at the end of the day, um, this is uh, a very sad incident. It's a very terrible incident. And uh, we, sh we should be looking for solidarity and um, and not looking to score uh, political points on our opponents. Uh, it, this, this is one rare moment of unity where the NRA um, and critics uh, of the Second Amendment have come together and they've realised that there does need to be some form of uh, extra regulation done on these uh, bumper stocks that are put into, into rifles like um, your AR-15 rifle to make it more like the uh, the, uh, the the M-15, I believe. Uh, so that that essentially makes the AR-15 a fully automatic rather than a semi-automatic um, assault rifle, uh, and that that is a dangerous thing. And uh, defenders uh, of the Second Amendment and people who are critics of the Second Amend Amendment have come together and realised that this is some middle ground that we can come to. So I think that this is a tragic yet unifying uh, uh, horror in Las Vegas. Well, the reason why the NRA, they're always, you know, so sceptical of these, you know, calls for greater, you know, gun control is because even though these gun control advocates, they, like, they don't admit it, they always say, oh, you know, we support the, the Second Amendment, you know, we don't want to take away your guns. The, what they always don't say is they'd like to if they could. I mean, if they could, you know, get away with, you know, confiscating, you know, most, you know, semi-automatic semi weapons having a national, you know, gun register, they, they could. Good. So that that's why um, you know supporters of uh, firearm rights have always you know have felt that these gun control advocates have been very disingenuous. Oh, and the, and they've got reason to as well, uh, for sure. Um, and uh, a lot lot about it is is scoring political points and not actually protecting the community. And you can't let um, your emotions get in the way of facts. For example, John Howard repetitively claims that the uh, there has been no mass shootings since Port Arthur, and now uh, the FBI considers a mass shooting anything over four people, and I believe that we we have seen an equal amount of uh, mass shootings since uh, prior to Port Arthur um, to to afterward, uh, and as well you can look at statistics and facts; they're beautiful. Uh, most gun, uh, most massacres happen within gun-free zones where people are defenceless. Uh, that's another thing you've got to look at. But obviously, you don't want people uh, being able to get these bump, bumper stocks or, or whatever they're called and uh, to to massacre people in such a way. Uh, there is a very, very fine line between safeguarding liberty and protecting. Uh, the community from madmen, and I think that that is what the NRA and um, other Second Amendment groups do realise. So it's uh, even though the NRA's uh, you know put put out this call for regulation, it's not shared by everybody in the firearms community. There's another. Um, uh, to use the term more radical Second Amendment organization, Gun Owners of America, which has already said that you know the NRA is you know sold out. They've you know they've compromised too much on this. Well, I don't really think that they have because I don't. I I really I I believe that protecting yourself and protecting your your property, your family, that that is that that is a form 
of, you know, that is that is great, you know, that's liberty, uh, that's safeguarded in the Second Amendment, but um, does one uh, need anything more than a semi-automatic assault rifle to protect one's family? Um, I don't really think so. You know, I'm, I'm all on board with uh, the semi-automatic and the, the not automatic, you know, but I think that uh, having an automatic, you know, um, assault rifle, uh, you know, an AK-47, an M-15, walking around the streets with one of those, uh, I think that that isn't really, I think that's probably going, I'm no uh, expert on the US Constitution, but I really think that that probably does, probably oversteps some constitutional marks as well. Um, but I think that the NRA is demonised, it's given a hard time, but I, I really do think that that is a mainstream group, uh, and it's a group that uh, is interested in preserving liberty uh, and protecting people from the tyranny of government. Uh, and I do think it's a good group, uh, but definitely I don't think that people need fully automatic guns walking around the streets. I think that their liberty probably should go as far as being able to have a semi-automatic rifle such as an AR-15. And of course, it's not just their uh, you know, people on the left calling for gun control. They've, you know, uh, as usual, usual, you know, tr uh, made a, you know, big deal about how, you know, Stephen Paddock was, you know, a white man, and you know, how come, you know, uh, we apparently treat, you know, uh, people of killers of different races, uh, you know, different, and you know, how come, oh, we're, you know, not calling it uh, terrorism. Well, yeah, there is there is a few interesting things to this. Uh, ISIS did claim that Paddock was one of their um, jihadis, one of their so-called freedom fighters for the Islamic Caliphate. Um, we're yet to see any proof of that. Um, the story of Paddock is an interesting one, though. He was a, a rec reclusive, uh, quiet and private man. He was uh, a professional gambler and a real estate agent and uh, a gun collector and he didn't appear to have any connections with Islam at all uh, and he, he didn't seem a particularly religious or a political uh, or a particularly political man so uh, his motives are a bit bemusing we, d we don't know what his motives are um, and also to, to throw a spanner in the works uh, to add some mysticism he wired $127,000 to his girlfriend in the Philippines. And we know that in some areas of the Philippines, there have been uh, massive uh, Islamic hotspots, big terrorism, but that, that's obviously more or less a conspiracy theory and um, it doesn't have any grounding uh, in evidence. But there, there are certainly uh, many things to think about here and one of them is, why didn't this man leave a note, and what was his motive? Yeah, I've noticed that there's plenty of uh, conspiracy theories, uh, you know, floating around, like, oh, maybe there was, you know, more than one shooter. I, I don't, you know, uh, indulge in those. But, yes, it is perplexing that even nearly a week after, we don't know the, the motive. That's why I said it's hard to know, you know, what action to take. But... Yeah, uh, focusing back on, you know, what some leftists have said, like, obviously, it was interesting while Lee Dali saying, you know, this is happening, you know, all too often, and he did one of his rants again. Uh, but the thing is, though, he never does this after an Islamic terror attack. He never says, this is happening, you know, all too often, and something must be done. And also, even more uh, ridiculous was uh, Yasmin abdel Megid, who said, we wouldn't be talking about uh, gun control if the shooter was Muslim. Well... Last year there was the Orlando Gay Nightclub Massacre where the shooter was Muslim and I remember the exact same gun control discussion then, so she's actually wrong. Well, um, Yasmin abdul Magid is not much better than a joke. Uh, she doesn't have a clue what she's talking about and she's full of pointless platitudes and virtue signalling. Um, there was... Um, equal uproar between these people being killed in at a country music festival and the tragic massacre that happened at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. Uh, so that just goes to prove that what she is saying is emphatically 
uh, incorrect and has it has no grounding in facts or reality. Um, also, I would have a lot more respect for uh, Wally Dali uh, if he called out uh, acts of Islamic terrorism as harshly and and with the same amount of vigor that he does with you know any uh, quote unquote mass shooting that happens in America. So I think that uh, Wally needs to uh, apply the same standards uh, to both uh, madmen walking around with AR-15s and jihadis blowing up kids in the streets of uh, Kabul. Yeah, it's it's certainly the the, the it always when the you know right when we you know may have. Uh, you know, talk, talk about a response after a tragedy. We're always accused of, oh, you know, exploiting the tragedy. But it's funny the the left there, they they're more than happy to do it, even if they don't uh, don't know the, the the facts themselves. Yes, well, Hillary Clinton, for example, you know, tweeting about this when she doesn't know the facts to, I don't know what for to sell books. It, it doesn't really make any sense to me, and I don't think that uh, it is healthy for us to indulge uh, in any conspiracy theory or to hijack this event for, you know, uh, political reasons. But certainly I do think that there is um, a need to ban these uh, bump stocks uh, or, or whatever they're called uh, because I think that it is, you know, welcoming carnage and chaos uh, if people are, are able to essentially walk around with a fully automatic weapon uh, within the streets. There is one thing of protecting yourself, your family, you know, um, your property, um, you know, and what have you. Uh, and then there's another thing, uh, walking around with a military grade weapon, um, which I find disturbing. I don't find it so disturbing having the right to a firearm such as a handgun or, you know, a rifle or even a semi-automatic uh, rifle such as an AR-15. But this man being able to, to legally buy semi-automatic weapons, put in a bump stock and massacre a group of people, I think this is a rare time where we can all agree that a little bit of regulation uh, couldn't hurt. Another bit of uh, international news which uh, jumped onto the uh, scene this week was uh, the uh, referendum in the autonomous Spanish uh, community of Catalonia on independence uh, last weekend. Now, the Spanish uh, Constitutional Court deemed this referendum illegal and they violently suppressed the, the voter turnout, which despite uh, this happening, there was, I think, over uh, 800 people injured. 90% uh, of uh, Catalans who were able to cast a vote uh, voted to become uh, independent. Uh, Spain has said they're not going to recognise the results of this referendum. Uh, Cat Catalonia have said that you know they're we're willing to have a unilateral declaration of independence. So it set the scene for uh, a showdown between the Spanish government and the the Catalan government, and it's it's really. Uh, you know, we thought we'd never see something like this in in Western Europe, where you know violent, uh, you know, scenes on the s streets with you know government, a uh, government basically oppressing uh, a group of people, and it's also raised the question, you know, should states have the right to, or regions of a nation have the right to secede? Well, it's a complex uh, legal issue as well. Um, I'm not sure about the any facets of European law in regards to this or in fact international law or, or, or even Spanish law. But I, I think that uh, it's interesting. Uh, if, if the people are wanting independence, there is only so long a time that the Spanish government can hold these people back from gaining their independence at the end of the day. Um, and I don't think that the, the, the use of military force to suppress a voter turnout is a very good option at all. In fact, it's something that you would expect uh, in a place like, um, uh, you know, Western Africa, Uganda, for instance, 
uh, where they use the military to, uh, you know, suppress voter turnout or, you know, uh, or Iraq in the days of Saddam Hussein. It's not something that you would expect uh, from a member of the, the European Union. So I'm very surprised with that. We, but the, the question of the legal the validity uh, the legal validity of this referendum is interesting. Uh, you said there's an, a 90 percent turnout, a 90 percent uh, vote good, which for does independence. Make... 90 percent vote. The turnout was uh, about half. 47. Yeah, sorry, I did get mixed up. Yeah, I think it was about 47 percent, and 90 90 percent voted for it. Uh, and I, the the issue is that. Uh, if only if less than half the people voted for it, even if it was an emphatic verdict like that, I don't think that you you can recognise it. Uh, you can't recognise it until you've got a voter turnout of more than two thirds, uh, and the the percentage voting for probably independence is more than two thirds. I would say. Um, so I think that this is a is a good indication of where Catalonia wants to go, but. I think until the Spanish military, you know, lets the people have a free vote, and we can truly see uh, what the demographics of, of Catalonia want to do in regard to their independence. I don't think that you, you can support a referendum uh, for success for secession uh, until that occurs. Well, that was my biggest problem with the whole process. That Sp as Spanish government and the Spanish constitutional court was was basically not at all open to letting Catalans you know, decide their, their own destiny. And you know, I think that it's a perfect demonstration that it seems that democracy is only extended uh, so far. That uh, basically, if you know a group of uh, people in a country don't feel like they're being uh, rep represented, of, or they don't like the direction the country's heading, they don't have uh, they they don't have the option to to go on their own and you know have the, have their own voice and I and I think that you know Spain's act, uh, Spanish government's actions have been have been quite telling that you know you're only uh, partly free. Yeah, well, I think that if the Catalonians were allowed a free vote, they would vote to to leave Spain, but until we can get that to happen, whether there needs to be some kind of UN supervision uh, throughout the, the whole voting process. That's another question. But until we can see the majority of people t going out to vote and the majority of people voting yes, then I don't think that this can go ahead. Uh, but the UN needs to tell Spain that uh, you can't be violently suppressing voter turnouts for independence. This is something that hasn't been seen in Spain, or in fact, probably the Western Europe since the days of, of Franco. So it is rather concerning that we are seeing this in a, you know, relatively progressive, democratic uh, Western European state such as Spain, and it makes us realise that the the that our liberty and our freedom and our democracy can crumble beneath our feet if, if we don't fight for it. And uh, it's interesting that you know European nations, they've all said this is an eternal matter for Spain. It's, they're, uh, they're, they're fine with, you know, say, you know, other nations seceding like, you know, South, South Sudan and, you know, East Timor and, you know, even Kosovo. But when it's, you know, somebody in the, you know, within their own backyard, they're like, you know, oh, this you know, can't possibly be allowed. We're all strong together. Like, for example, I really rejected David Cameron's uh, interference in the Scottish uh, referendum a few years ago. I thought he should have been, you know, hands off and let the, the Scots decide, you know, whether they wanted to become independent and not try to, you know, influence the outcome. Yeah, at the end of the day, this decision is for the Catalonians to make or or the Spaniards that live in Catalonia, depending how you want to look at it, uh, it's it's their decision to make, and it's no one else's decision, and no one else really should be trying to influence them. Um, and I, I really do think that David Cameron's uh, interference within the Scottish referendum a couple of years ago probably 
did more, uh, you know, in favour of the other side's viewpoint. And I think that telling the Catalonians that secession is a bad idea will probably only galvanise them uh, and unite them uh, to break away from Spain. So I think that the European community should just respect the rights of Catalonians at this stage. And they have... You know, historically, you know, small nations do better than, than larger nations. I mean, this whole, you know, motto of stronger together, it's not actually true. I mean, look at nations such as Switzerland and, you know, Austria, which was, you know, once part of um, uh, the German co uh, Confederation. I mean, they're very successful small nations. And even if you go smaller, if you look at, you know, Luxembourg, uh, going over to Asia, if you look at, you know, Singapore and, you know, Hong Kong, which is still, you know, got some form of independence, you know, they're some of the wealthiest, you know, nations in the world. And, you know, they're not at threat of, you know, being, you know, invaded. They have lots of companies have, have their headquarters there. I mean, they're, they're great places to live despite their size. Yeah, and if, going back to Germany, I guess if you've got different ethnic groups of people living under one country, such as Yugoslavia, for instance, that does cause some tension as well. And if the countries are, uh, well, divided into their ethnic or cultural groups uh, as well, uh, then there's less clash. Um, you know, that that, that is good. Uh, and as well, the fiscal management of a country tends to be better if it's a smaller nation as well, if you, as you said, if you look at countries like New Zealand or, or uh, Hong Kong or, or what have you, their fiscal management tends to be a lot bit better than, than huge countries like the United States and Russia where there's a lot of potential for uh, manipulation and uh, corruption, uh, you know, special interest favours. Uh, that all becomes less likely as well when the, the populace of the country is smaller because there's less people to govern and therefore less government itself. That's why I'm broadly sympathetic with the uh, Western Australian secession movement or uh, WAXIT, which they, they, there was a motion at the, the previous uh, Western Australian Liberal State Conference to uh, explore secession. You know, if they want, you know, want feel that you know they're a different peoples from Australia and want to, you know, make it on their own, they've got plenty of resources to make it happen. Then, you know, I say, you know, go for it. Um, I'm not as radical as you there, Tim. Um, I like WA because there's, uh, you know, we can. There's a lot of mining there, you know, how else is our, you know, huge uh, government going to function if we can't steal tax dollars from WA, Tim? We've got to be realistic here. Um, but yeah, WA have, have got a lot to complain about. Uh, they are probably one of the most, you know, efficient you know, state economies of probably the last decade because of the mining boom, uh, but they haven't you know, received many of the services back that they've paid in taxation. Um, and most of, say, the, the money and the, the tax money that's created through the, the great efficiency of the Western Australian economy has been pumped into less efficient um, economies such as South Australia. Um, I guess, after all, we, we do live in a federation, but this, this type of federation that we, we do live in isn't... Um, about you know states competing against one another anymore. It's about uh, you know to compete. You know who can have the best, but it's it's to compete about which states can manage to get the most uh, GST or almost tax revenue uh, back from the federal government. So I think that our very uh, federation itself has been corrupted, and this has happened you know after you know around World War Two when the when the federal government you know gained the powers. Uh, to levy income tax. So I think that that's where the, this vast centralisation and this overinflated governments come from. And I think that we are seeing the consequences of that through a small yet influential movement in the waxed. A news item which is not fresh and which we've talk, been talking about for quite a while now is the uh, plebiscite on same-sex marriage. But we actually got 
some form of result this week with the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, saying so far they've received 9.2 million uh, responses, which is a 57.5% uh, uh, turnout. Uh, this is still with around about f uh, five weeks to, to go. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of uh, responses in the mail because we know how uh, slow Australia Post is. So it's clear uh, that you know, Australians obviously you know, liked having their, their say. And you know, I, I'm certainly of the belief that even though it's been you know, quite you know, heated at times, like I, I think you know, giving the people... Uh, a say on, on this issue and giving the people a, a greater say is a good thing. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I guess it's the, the direct democracy that uh, the French Revolution was about, in a sense. You know, people are, are sick of having the, the king or the, uh, the aristocracy, which is now probably the bureaucrats and the parliamentarians making decisions on their behalf because they are so, you know, influenced not by the needs and wants of their le electorate anymore, but they're influenced by special interests and lobbyists. And, and I really do think that this is a true, you know, direct democracy, a return to d direct democracy. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think that with important issues such as marriage, uh, people love having their, their voice heard once in a while. And uh, we have to remember that this was not compulsory. This is the first voluntary vote we've had uh, in uh, about 20 years. And, like, there was a lot of, you know, obviously, uh, you know, people cynical saying, like, oh, you know, if people won't, you know, bother to vote if, you know, they're, they're not forced to. And then, you know, the ridiculous arguments that, oh, young people don't know what a post box is, like, how insulting. But these statistics show that, you know, the Australian people... You know, even though they were not forced to, they wanted to they wanted to vote. Yeah, well, it's been the the pet, you know, the the uh, well, the, the 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 creation of the media, this whole argument around same sex marriage, it's been going on for about the last ten years. Uh, it used to be a, probably a fringe movement that would get as much as. 20, you know, probably between 25 and 30 percent of people following it at most. But now it's become more mainstream. Uh, you can see that definitely. Uh, our classrooms, Christianity, and, and the basic uh, Judeo-Christian moral teachings have been taken out of classrooms. Uh, gender has been stripped away from sex ed. Um, you know. We're going in a completely different cultural uh, direction. Some would say that this is great, it's inclusive, it's progressive, and many would say that it's a degradation of, you know, traditional or normal values. Uh, but at the end of the day, this uh, has at least got probably 50% support, um, you know, and I've, you know, pundits, pundits say that, you know, it could get as much as you know, 60% support, but I'm definitely thinking that it is around the, probably the 55% mark that it will receive support for because there are both passionate and heated voices on both sides, but at the end of the day, I, I am looking forward to this whole debacle being over. Yeah, there was uh, a lot more substantial polling that was released this week, which did indicate, you know, a strong you know, yes, uh, you know, majority vote. I think that you know, yes, we'll get up, but not by you know the the landslides that are that are predicted. I noticed there was some no polling released this week, in which uh, was significantly lower. It still had uh, yes uh, ahead of no. But I think with you know because this reform is you know uh, such a major change that you know if if it is yes, then I think that result will be you know, uh, it'll have more authority and, you know, we can properly move on from this debate. I'm hoping we can move on from this because I'm quite frankly sick of it. Um, I, I was listening to uh, an interesting podcast on CNN, of all places, and it was uh, Grover Norquist being interviewed by David Axelrod. Um, and he was saying that the main issue that unites the right 
uh, is their want to be left alone, whether it's homeschooling or or whatever. You know, it's their want to be left alone. But the major thing, the major, the, the only vote-winning thing was uh, the lower taxes. So I think at the end of the day, um, people you know, we'll move on from the same-sex marriage issue. It won't be a vote-changing issue at all because liberal voters are people who uh, want, you know, lower taxes, less regulation and more of a, a business-friendly environment. And I really don't think that this same-sex marriage issue uh, will stick around for much longer after this plebiscite has been resolved. Uh, although I definitely do agree with Howard and Abbott in regards to that, that liberty needs to be safeguarded uh, for you know preachers and and whatnot, um, and you definitely you see the more radical elements of the yes side saying, well, it's still an active form of discrimination if homosexuals you know aren't being married within the church, and we need to force um, priests to 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 marry homosexuals and. Um, this is happening in Sweden, and uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons in, in, in Britain as well has been pushing for this. So we, we do have to realise that this will probably get up, but that the, the liberties of the religious um, and the, the ethical objectors uh, will need to be safeguarded uh, by some form of legislation. Yeah, and that'll be the, the next phase if the yes vote does get up. I mean, obviously, we hope that, you know, because you know, the Turnbull government does have a majority in the lower house, even though it's one, they can you know, ma make sure that there are uh, appropriate uh, protections. And it's it's also, you know, one because this was one of Turnbull's key election promises to hold this plebiscite. And so we ho hope, also hope that once, you know, this is behind us, then, you know, maybe the uh, the polls for Turnbull, you know, will recover because people, you know, move on to, you know, the the economic issues, uh, uh, specifically, you know, the the energy crisis uh, where we're currently in and, you know, maybe start to, you know, look at, look at the the parties from a new angle. Yeah, it will be very good. Um, very good to have this over. It's just a corrosive issue. It's not taking us anywhere. And um, I can't wait for when we don't have to talk about it anymore. Well, I think for the two campaigns, the yes and the no campaigns, are, are winding down. I'm seeing sort of less uh, aggressiveness, which uh, which is good. And yeah, now I just yeah want a result. Yeah, it's a bit like waiting for uh, Santa Claus to deliver the presents on New Year's Eve. You know, we're at that time where we're sick of the wait and the anticipation and we're just waiting for the delivery. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll try not to talk about it next week if we can. I, 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 I hope we don't have to talk about it. We had a suggestion this week from mining billionaire Andrew Twiggy Forrest that the smoking age should be raised to uh, 21. To, uh, he, the reasons that he gave was, you know, fighting cancer and also to stop young people taking up uh, smoking. And uh, I always can't stand whether it's, you know, uh, here it's the smoking age uh, or it's the, the drinking age. You know, people want that raised to 21. I mean, I always say, you know, do we really want to treat young people as children, you know, any longer? Like at, you know, 18, they're allowed to, you know, vote, drive, they already, you know, uh, pay tax. I think that, well, no, not just that, but it would lead to, you know, more black market activity than we already have, because remember, we already have the high taxes and the, uh, the, the plain packaging, and I just think this is a, another extension of the, the nanny state. Yeah, well, I think it's just a, a crazy idea. Uh, I don't really see how this is going to change anything, because it said that you know, 90% of people smoke started when they're children, so raising to 21 is going to change all that. It doesn't, because uh, the point that Twiggy made was that most people start when they're kids, so therefore raising it to 21 will change all that. It's nothing to do with the legal age why people start. So I think that he hasn't looked into that at all. And the proposal to uh, ban tobacco sales for people 
born after 2000 is crazy. This, this is all well in. If people want to, to breathe corrosive and toxic tobacco fumes that are, you know, full of arsenic and rat poison, you know, that's their freedom, it's their liberty. It's the same liberty, liberty that gives you the right to fart in your car or balloon up to 300 kilos and have a heart attack by 45. You know, this... This is ridiculous, um, and and you're completely right about what you said before. Uh, that if people are, you know, could potentially be conscripted to to the army, or they um, they they have voting rights and driving rights, and they can drink. Uh, does this really make any sense, or or is he just being Twiggy being given all this money from the government to come up with these, you know, crazy ideas to tackle all these things and you know, he's just spat out some complete and utter bullshit. It's it's not going to change anything on public health. If anything, it's just going to increase the power of organised crime and the black market. Um, and you can see that the increased taxation and the plain packaging, all that's led to is not better public health, as the, you know, public health Puritans would like us to think, but it's led to more black market and more you know, cheaply produced harmful tobacco products, you know, hitting the streets. Uh, that These black market, you know, products, uh, you go to a store, they don't ask for ID. So, in fact, it leads to more kids probably starting smoking as well. So I think that this is a, a poorly conce conce um, conceived uh, idea to apparently help people. I have Twiggy Forrest, like he, like he has some good ideas when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, indigenous welfare, uh, but I often find with these, you know, billionaires such as him, they've sort of, they've like, you know, made, you know, as much money as they think they need and then they, you know, sort of turn to this philanthropic uh, area and and that's why they come out with these you know often you know nanny state interventionist ideas because you know they want to you know help try and you know change the 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 country for the for the better and so I think that uh, that's probably playing a role here that you know he's you know the, he's he's wanting to sort of you know like be do something you know good for the country and like the, this is you know uh, what he thinks is a bright idea but you know it's People, like, if you don't know that smoking like, is bad for your health by now, I mean, you know, throughout, you know, your 12 years of schooling, you constantly, you know, got these, you know, life education, health education about how bad smoking is. Like, you know, people people know that now. And so they they can today, now more than, you know, any time, like, in the past 50 years, make an informed choice, you know, uh, do I want to, you know, take up smoking, do I value the enjoyment of smoking more than the adverse health impacts? Um, yeah, well, as I said, I don't think this will get up. I think it's just a thought bubble. Uh, it's crazy. Um, and I think that Twiggy is suffering from the Dick Smith syndrome. Uh, you know, Dick Smith has all these thought bubbles and because he's a a millionaire or a billionaire, I don't know what he is. Now, he can afford to take an advert in a paper or get some TV cameras pointed at him. And just because he's been a successful mining magnate doesn't mean that he's got, you know, all the correct and successful ideas to, you know, figure out our problems within our public health or our health services in general or, or even just the health of our nation. What, what he's good at is, you know, digging up, you know, dinosaur. Uh, dung from the ground, uh, or you know, iron. You know, he's 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 his specialty is not in public health um, or health in general, and I think that we should leave those kind of decisions up to the experts. Uh, you, you say that uh, it's not likely to get up, but yeah, we have to remember that this is, uh, you know, the the same federal government on both sides, which are like cigarette prices. It's now above, you know, a dollar a, a cigarette stick. I mean, you know, that's just ridiculous. Nearly, you know, forty dollars for a standard uh, pack of, you know, cigarettes, and they uh, and they don't seem to have learnt the. You know the the lessons of you know prohibition. There's already a thriving you know black black market, and so you know I'm not surprised if you know if that the government would want to take this smoking crusade you know even further. Uh, well, prohibition 
didn't work. Uh, and I think that this, in a sense, is a form of prohibition. It's saying that people are stupid, so we should take the right away from them to make a decision. Uh, and then people are naturally going to be rebellious. Uh, crime is naturally going to latch on to this. And you could say that the prohibition uh, in America caused uh, a lot of organised crime, you know, a lot of systemic corruption that, that affected the nation for generations upon generations. So, you know, one has to be logical and reasonable about this and realise that adults uh, have, you know, should have the right to to purchase a legal product if, if they believe that that's the decision that they want to make. And I don't think that the government should be interfering uh, in that at all. Uh, and you already have, you know, excessive syntax upon uh, on upon tobacco, and I think that that, you know, is already heavy-handed enough from the government, yet alone to increase the smoking age to 21. Uh, and... It's also worth pointing out that it's not just black market activity, there's also, uh, and this is happening in New Zealand as well, where they've got high tobacco taxes, you know, actually, you know, robberies of, you know, tobacco nests, you know, where, you know, ram raids, you know, people, you know, stealing the, uh, the tobacco products from the shelf because they're now just so valuable. Yeah, well, it's, it's created... Um a situation where you have got a highly inflated, you know, product uh, and you've got people who are desperately addicted to it and the government can just keep hiking and hiking and hiking. Um, and it's just really sad. It's, it's taking advantage of essentially, you know, people who've been addicted to, uh, to it since they were children or... Uh, working class people who are, you know, carrying an unnecessary tax burden from this, taking money that could be in their pockets to help their children, to help their families, and instead it's going to the government. Uh, and it also probably, uh, when, when the government hikes prices, probably, you know, the tobacco companies probably add an extra dollar or two onto their profit margin as well. So it's only helping big business and big government and at the end of the day, the, the consumer or, or the average Australian is the one that's, that's suffering from this. And as we know already that the, this famous uh, Thank You for Smoking survey that Senator David Lionhelm uh, speaks up, uh, sometimes about, they, smokers have a net benefit to the public health system because they are less likely to take age pensions and, you know, they are less likely uh, to live longer. So I really think that when you walk past someone who's, you know, smoking one of those stinky carcinogenic cancerous sticks that you should say thank you. You know, you're funding my big government, you know, uh, gravy train ride. And I think that the attitude's completely wrong. Although sadly, I think that uh, Australia's nanny state policies aren't going to end any time soon. Uh, but that's all we've got time for uh, today. So thank you once again, Jacob, for uh, for coming on. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure to be to be on, Tim. And I just can't wait till we've got some state of of normality in our society, and you know things are uh, are free from the the heavy hand of the government and the craziness of the, the regressive left and the social justice warrior. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you all for watching. Please like, share and comment uh, and let us know what you think. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A Liberty Fest in Brisbane is now less than a week away on Saturday the 14th of October 2017, which we are a sponsor of. It is hosted by our good friends at Liberty Works. If you still haven't got your tickets, remember you can get a 20% discount by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.